Welcome, Age of Vintage Society. As the preferred starlet of famed director Cecil B. DeMille, Gloria Swanson was the undeniable queen of the silent era, yet for all of the glamorous star's striking looks and acting chops, her life was full of more drama and tragedy than the film she starred in. How Gloria Swanson spent $250 million a week. Make sure to watch the video until the end and leave your thoughts in the comments. If you are new here, join our wonderful community by subscribing to the Age of Vintage channel. Gloria Swanson, Hollywood's iconic diva. Ready for her close-up. Gloria Swanson wasn't here to make friends. She wasn't just like us. She didn't take out the garbage or wear cotton or go to the bathroom. Lady had a gold-plated bathtub. She married a Marquis. She was four foot eleven, wore a two and a half inch shoes, and had a waist approximately the size of my neck. She looked most beautiful when frowning, and for a period in the 1920s she was the biggest star in the world. Swanson wasn't evil, but she just knew how to run that game. She was of a different set of stars, a different breed than Garbo, Dietrich and other classic idols, that truly lived like demigods. And when Hollywood began to change the way it made and distributed films in the late twenties, she was one of dozens destined to remain a relic of an earlier time. She was a self-confident actress, negotiated a creative path through seven decades of celebrity. It also illuminates a little-known chapter in American media history, how the powerful women of early Hollywood transformed their remarkable careers after their stars dimmed. Swanson cavorted in slapstick short films with Charlie Chaplin and Max Sennett in the 1910s. The popularity of her films with Cecil B. DeMille helped create the star system. A glamour icon, Swanson became the most talked-about star in Hollywood, earning three Academy Award nominations, receiving 10,000 fan letters every week, and living up to a reputation as Queen of Hollywood. She bought mansions and penthouses, dressed in fur and feathers, and flitted through Paris, London and New York, engaging in passionate love affairs that made headlines and caused scandals. Frustrated with the studio system, Swanson turned down a million-dollar-a-year contract. After a wild ride making unforgettable movies with some of Hollywood's most colourful characters, including her lover Joseph Kennedy and Maverick director Eric von Stronheim, she was a million dollars in debt. Without hesitation, she went looking for her next challenge, beginning her long second act. She became a talented businesswoman who patented inventions and won fashion awards for her clothing designs, a natural foods activist decades before it was fashionable, an exhibited sculptor and a designer employed by the United Nations. All the while she continued to act in films, theatre and television at home and abroad. Though she had one of Hollywood's most famous exit lines, All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up, the real Gloria Swanson never looked back. This video brings Swanson back into the spotlight, revealing her as a complex, creative, entrepreneurial and thoroughly modern woman. She became synonymous with Norma Desmond, her character in that film, but she was much, much more. One of the first women to start her own production company, the first star to publicly become a mother in Hollywood, and a serious pioneer of the organic food movement. I am not even kidding. She bought and sold patents ran her own household and supported various husbands. She designed a dress line for middle-aged ladies in the 1950s using glamour sizes, read size 12 and up, and made millions. Again, she knew how to run that game. She was born Gloria May Josephine Swanson on March 27, 1899 in Chicago, the only child of Joseph Theodore and Adelaide Klanowski Swanson. As in the 19th century, she was an army brat. Her father's position as a civilian supply officer with the army took the family to Key West, Florida and San Juan, Puerto Rico, but the majority of Swanson's childhood was spent in Chicago. In 1914, a young Gloria Swanson was visiting Chicago-based film studio s &A with her aunt when a talent scout spotted her. She was asked to come back and work as an extra sometime. 
After a few months as an extra, Swanson dropped out of high school to work full time. Another famous SNA alumni? Well, none other than Charlie Chaplin. At the age of 17, Swanson appeared in a bunch of Max Sennett comedies. Max Sennett was best known for his Bathing Beauties, a group of young starlets who looked cute in bathing suits and whom Sennett placed in comedies for pure titillation. I realise that you're probably thinking that these girls are wearing more clothes than most high schoolers currently wear to prom. They were blatant, unapologetic eye candy. Swanson appeared in a Max Sennett comedy in her bathing suit, but for the rest of her life she would insist that she was not a bathing beauty. Those were a different type of girl. Carol Lombard was a bathing beauty. Dozens of other eager girls with supple legs were bathing beauties. She was a serious actress. She moved to California where she worked for Sennett Keystone Studios before rising to stardom at Paramount in such Cecil B. DeMille features as Male and Female and The Affairs of Anatole. Between 1919 and 1921, Swanson and DeMille made a total of six films together, with him directing and her playing the romantic lead. Their first collaboration together, Don't Change Your Husband, was Swanson's first big hit film, setting the stage for the films that followed. Unlike many of the stars of the silent age, she wasn't marked by any particular ethnicity, nor was she an exotic import from Europe. She was an American mutt. During this period, Swanson endured what can only be described as a horrible marriage to fellow Senate star Wallace Beery. They married on her 17th birthday. He forced himself on her the night of the wedding, and when she later became pregnant, he tricked her into drinking a mixture that would abort the baby. Beery was a drunkard and an abuser, and while this all sounds like a bad Lifetime movie, Swanson knew what was what. She left him almost immediately after the abortion machinations, even though the divorce took three years to finalise. But Swanson was undeterred in her professional life. Remember, girl knew how to play the game. She parlayed her popularity from the Senate films into a contract with Paramount, where she made approximately a billion films, as all the silent stars did. She consistently worked with Cecil B. DeMille and made a slew of what can only be called silent rom-com drams. Two people, sometimes of varying social class, sometimes not, love each other, can't love each other, want to love each other, plus hijinks and resolution and ridiculously gorgeous clothes. There are also the films that made Swanson a tremendous star, along the lines of Charlie Chaplin, Mary Pickford and Douglas Fairbanks. By 1922 she was all of 23 years old. She had become so popular and brought so much money to Paramount that they essentially gave her everything she wanted. The biggest clothing budgets, the most extravagant salary demands. Her stage image, both on the screen and off, was that of the clothes horse, a woman whose outfits were just as important as the plot. Swanson set the trend in hairstyles, hat styles and skirt lengths and encouraged millions worldwide. Despite her first divorce, she seemed to be playing by the rules. She married Herbert Somborn, movie company president, in 1919 and gave birth to a daughter, Gloria, the next year. But then Mama Gloria apparently got busy. When husband Herbert filed for divorce in 1922, he claimed that Swanson had engaged in relations with at least 13 other men, including co-stars Rudolph Valentino and director Cecil B. DeMille. At the height of her career in 1925, already a veteran of some 50 films, she ended her long association with Paramount in order to become a partner with United Artists, independently producing her own films. Though producing artistically successful films such as Sadie Thompson and her first talkie, The Trespasser, both of which earned her Academy Award nominations, the financial strains of her production companies all but ended her career. After her final United Artists feature release in 1933, she made only one other film, for Fox Films, during the 1930s. After disappearing from the screen for most of the 30s and 40s, Swanson returned to Hollywood in an unforgettable way. She starred in iconic film Sunset Boulevard as Norma Desmond, a past her prime silent film star determined to make a comeback. It is easily ranked among the best films ever made. 
on countless critics' lists' top lists, the Library of Congress deemed it culturally significant, and the National Film Registry preserved it for future generations. In 1925, she went to France to film Madame Sans Gêne, where she just happened to run into the Marquis de Falaise, grandson of the founder of Hennessy Cognac. Now, despite his Hennessy relations, this Marquis had to work for a living, and that's where Swanson found him, translating on set. One French thing led to another, and she returned home to America as La Marquise de la Falaise, thereafter shortened to La Swanson. The stories of Swanson's return are straight out of an embellished fairy tale. She was met at the depot by two bands, film dignitaries, ushers on horseback, and thousands of people. She was placed in a limousine with eight motorcycle police escorts preceding her up Sunset Boulevard. Thousands of schoolchildren lined the sidewalk and threw flowers at her. From a Hedda Hopper article called Long Time Star, says she was the first to take on both career and family. Swanson's salary only continued to rise. At one point she was making, and spending, $20,000 a week, which is a cool quarter of a million in today's dollars. These were the days of the gold bathtub, black marble bathroom, four personal secretaries, and an Atlantic City boardwalk chair in which a manservant wheeled her around the studio lot. Girls spent $10,000 a year, $125,000-ish in today's dollars, on lingerie. For a 300-person dinner party, she gave favours of solid gold compacts for women and solid gold cigarette cases for men fur coats, diamonds, hundreds of dresses and shoes and stockings in a serious, clueless Alicia Silverstone overdose of sartorial luxury. She fell in with Kennedy somewhat innocently. In 1927, Paramount offered Swanson a staggering $1 million a year, but Swanson was sick of the repetitive genre films she had been cast in over the last decade, and understandably wanted more control of her product. She starred and produced, but had no real idea of how to produce, which led to various problems with management, script, and someone who could do a convincing double exposure. It's heady work and Swanson was unprepared. Her films were sometimes way over budget and performed way below expectations. On the advice of Schneck, Swanson returned to Hollywood, tail between her well-dressed legs, to work on something more mainstream and tenable. Swanson tries to restart her identity. She divorces the long-suffering Marquis in 1930 and attempts to reinvigorate her career with a bevy of talkies, none of them successful. She marries Michael Farmer in 1931, gives birth to a second daughter, Michelle, in 1932. Her career dwindles to nothing, yet another silent star who withered on the branch, a glittering if somewhat faded artefact of cinema history. So she did what any faded star should. She moved to New York and got in the patent business. But she did it in a roundabout sort of way, starting a company punnily called Multi Prizes, which, starting in 1938, made a mission of rescuing Jewish smarty pantsies from Europe, bringing them to America, and then working together with their patents, inventions, science experiments, etc., etc. It's unclear how exploitative this may or may not have been, but several scientists made it out of Europe. Good. And Swanson failed to make any significant amount of money. No one was a bigger star than Gloria Swanson in the final days of the silent film era. Of course, no one was paid as much either. But don't think that Swanson saved her funds for a rainy day. She spent almost all of the $8 million she earned in the 1920s. Gloria Swanson was beyond doubt the brightest star in Hollywood's glittering firmament for many decades, beginning in the era of silent films, continuing well into the post-war period. To a surprising degree, she understood and manipulated the idea of celebrity with an almost incalculable sense of entrepreneurship, managing to survive in a medium challenged, then as now, by rapid technological shifts. If you liked this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe if you are new here, and if you want to support my work, please visit my Patreon page. Now it is your turn. What do you think about the life and legacy of Gloria Swanson? Swanson's image was unironic in a way that we can't quite understand. 
She didn't appear glamorous and elegant, she embodied glamour and elegance.